Hello and welcome again to Why Fight, a conference on politics and ideology in militaries and armed groups, organized by the UCD Center for War Studies. Our papers in this session will examine how ideologies are set of vaguely, but not necessarily consistent ideas, have influenced the behavior of soldiers, officers, and military planners. Our next speaker is Alan Donoghue, an independent researcher specializing in German military history. In this paper, Alan will examine how German ideological influence shaped American strategy in the early phase of the Cold War. He will recount the fascinating story of former Wehrmacht officers working in the historical division of the US Army and how they influenced US military planning in the critical early stage of US-Soviet rivalry. Well, my name is Alan Donoghue. I'm an independent researcher. My paper today is entitled German Ideological Influences on American Cold War Strategy, the U.S. Army Historical Division, 1947-1954. My main area of research is the German-Soviet War, so the Eastern Front. And this paper ties in uh, well with that research in the sense that the German generals who wrote for the Historical Division, uh, most of them fought for Germany on the Eastern Front. So just a few introductory remarks. As American-Soviet relations rapidly deteriorated after 1945, the German officers of the US Army Historical Division passed on not, not only their myths of an honorable German military, but also their highly prejudiced operational assessments of the Soviet Union and the requirements necessary to militarily defeat it. Thus, in the first of many examples of post-war cooperation and doctrinal exchanges between the US and German militaries, this politicized minority of German officers working for the historical division also came to exercise an indirect but substantial voice in the evolution of US army doctrine after 1947. It was at this time, just after the war, a mystique in the US regarding the Wehrmacht and its generals, culminating in the belief that if it weren't for Hitler, then things would have turned out differently. It was as if the German generals knew how to defeat the Soviets, but were simply hamper, hampered by Hitler's meddling, an incorrect and therefore dangerous conclusion. So I've divided the talk uh, into subsections. I begin, first of all, with a brief description of the creation of the operational history German section, followed by a brief discussion of the economic and political situation at the time, then racism and anti-communism in the United States, and finally the effects of uh, these reports, these German reports on US military and political strategy. So the creation of the Operational History German section, this was formed in January 1946 under the auspices of the US Army Historical Division to exploit enemy experiences against American forces by questioning over 500 German generals who had basically fought against the Americans during the war. In addition to the Western Front combat narratives requested by the section came unsolicited personal accounts of warfare against the Soviet Union. The head of the section was a man who was to become very well respected in the United States, Franz Halder, uh, despite the fact that he had been one of Hitler's army chiefs of staff during the war. The reports of the fighting in the East were in the foreground after a short time. This expansion of the program resulted not least from the changes that had now taken place in the relationship between, between the victorious powers especially between the US and the Soviet Union. So ideology was to the fore right from the, from the beginning. With each passing year, the historical vision became more and more used. The conflict in Korea in 1950 also increased the number of questions about details of the German experience in guerrilla warfare in Russia, supply problems in difficult terrain, and psychological warfare against non-Western peoples. Many of these reports and studies were used in the army in various forms for education and training, as well as to enrich the general knowledge of soldiers of all ranks. So economics and politics, beginning with the economic situation at the time, 
military and political leaders in the West recognized that communist parties could exploit the distress and that the Russians could capitalize upon it to spread Soviet influence throughout uh, Western Europe. The greatest danger to the security of the United States, the CIA concluded in mid-1947, is the possibility of economic collapse in Western Europe and the consequent accession to power of communist elements. This political uh, situation, um, historians disagree over exactly what caused it, what caused the Cold War, and whether the US-Soviet conflict was inevitable or if it was simply the result of foreign policy miscalculations. But none dispute the impact of the communist threat on the contours and subsequent strategy of the American military. So this basically came to be known as containment. The idea was to prevent the Soviet Union from using the power and position it won as a result of the Second World War to reshape the post-war international order. It represented a, basically a desirable middle ground between appeasement and war. As communism spread even in Western Europe, policymakers searched for an ideological means to contain communism. Diplomat George F. Kennan, who first articulated America's containment policy of measured responses to Soviet aggression, called for an ideological mobilization of the nation's resources to counter Russian psychological warfare, suggesting that the American people lacked the discipline and resolute character required to fight the Cold War. It was the responsibility of the federal government, in his mind, therefore, to inform the people about the realities of the Cold War and to reform the national character. This also extended to the military, which expected service members to be staunchly anti-communist. Through persuasion, coercion, and as a last resort, criminal prosecution, the United States Standing Armed Forces curtailed individualism in favor of molding obedient troops. They tried to ferret out treasonous intent, for example, and faltering allegiance through constant surveillance and aggressive investigation, in effect becoming authoritarian themselves. And by 1950, NATO was heading towards large conventional forces once again. So in 1950, for example, the number of American troops in Western Europe was 80,000. Two years later, this had jumped to almost a quarter of a million. So a brief discussion of racism and anti-Bolshevism in the United States around this time, uh, specifically anti-Slav racism. So after World War I, the Bolshevik Revolution, which had terrified most Americans, weakened American enthusiasm for the ambitions of the American Russians and Ukrainians. The immigration legislation of 1917 to 1924 and the subsequent McCarran-Walter Act of 1952 were basically based on the assumption that national origin of an immigrant was a reliable indication of his capacity for Americanization. And so-called old immigrants, so those from Northern Europe and Western Europe, were regarded as okay, whereas those from Eastern Europe and the Balkans, not so much. In the course of World War II then, uh, there was bitter criticism regarding the disloyalty of the American Slavs because some of them supported, possibly unwittingly, the communist-dominated All-Slav Congress. Finally, the Truman Doctrine of March 1947 put into place the twin pillars of foreign and domestic policy that would determine the structure of American political discourse for the next four decades. The implications of this new hegemony of anti-communism were already evident in 1947 and 1948, well before the vaulted rise of McCarthyism the early 1950s. So the effects of these writings on US military and political strategy, well, first of all, these German reports were replete with national socialist racism. After World War II, the idea of Judeo-Bolshevism had become taboo, but Asiatic Bolshevism most certainly had not now came to take its place. The employment of national character as a mode of analysis was a recurring theme throughout many of the finalized German reports produced under Halder and his staff in the history of the war in the East. Recommendations in the reports for future actions by the United States against the Soviet Union were also informed by racial language and inherent Soviet aggressiveness, intransigence and fanatical devotion to world revolution called for a decisive Western response. 
So to give one example, a former Austrian general who served with the Wehrmacht um, Lothar Mendelich, he suggested that the Russian people were receptive to the Bolshevik state as their endurance, primitive nature, and relative docility complemented nicely the demands of a dictatorship. Mendelich repeatedly attested that Russian operational leadership was poor and initiative and aggressiveness non-existent. In the absence of absence of commissars, Russian infantry operations were successful only when provided with overwhelming superiority in numbers of troops, tanks and artillery along the front. The downfall of the German armed forces in the east, according to Rendelich, was due only to superior numbers of these innately inferior troops. From his and other reports, we are, which are heavily influenced by national socialist ideology, the Red Army emerges as an overwhelming horde of backward peasants. Now, of course, we know that this absolutely wasn't true. Certainly from 1943 onwards, the Red Army was more than a match for the Wehrmacht, operationally speaking. Another example is from Gunter Blumetritt. He was instrumental in planning the 1939 German invasion of Poland, for example, and also the 1940 invasion of France in the Lowlands. And he was also one of the most prolific writers for the historical division. His writings reproduced familiar tropes in describing the origins and aims of the Soviet Union. Bolshevism to him was an alien spirit. Uh, it had survived and reproduced itself in disease-like fashion in the East through the use of Asiatic dictatorial means. The East would stop at nothing to achieve the aims of world revolution, using innate duplicity and treachery to lull the West into a false sense of security. The only solution, therefore, was to rally politically all that is left, including the Western zones of Germany, in a union of common defence against this so-called red menace. Blumentritt also spoke in the Nazi jargon of the Anglo-Teutonic blood of the early American settlers and the disturbing emergence of what he called illegal warfare in the Second World War, essentially what we now know as partisan warfare which, according to him, did not appeal to the German people or other Germanic nations. His recommend, recommendations to the Americans, therefore, were also obvious should war break out, the West would have to be, have to basically be just as violent as, as the Soviets were. Only through the eradication of the Soviet system could the cycle of brutality come to an end, since Soviet operational methods linked to race and ethnicity would not change. The US Chief of Military History, Orlando Ward, had a favorable impression, favorable impression of his work by the catalog of foreign military studies circulated throughout the army, uh, described two of his reports as useful in understanding the Russian mentality. Even Halder himself had noted that he was participating in the program to continue the struggle against Bolshevism. In effect, the Americans gave him entree to rewrite German military history while ignoring his own personal role in the implementation of Hitler's criminal orders. For many years after the war, both Halder and his fellow uh, generals managed in their memoirs to convince most in the West that they had simply tried to stem the Asiatic flood during the war and they could now help to do so uh, in the Cold War. The military, the US military, was also affected by this ideology. As US perceptions of the Soviets grew negative, American perceptions of the Germans and the German army became increasingly positive. Having received orders to prepare for prolonged uh, forward defense in Europe in 1948, American military leaders sought examples of long-term defensive warfare as a basis for future doctrine. Finding nothing suitable in recent American military history, obviously, the army turned to the historical division. This led to the so-called Peace Series, an American effort to learn from the Wehrmacht. From 1947, all this material began to appear on army, American Army officer reading lists. From 1950, the so-called German Report Series was distributed throughout the American Army and covered a broad range of topics. The Army's position defense still held sway in operational doctrine in 1949, but the movement towards mobile defense had gained momentum through the work of the historical division. So all of these reports were basically sanctioned by the uh, uh, historical division. Each was available for extended loan to approved military training and uh, uh, training sites and academies. 
as well as to interested American officers. According to the official catalogue of German studies, the reports were used by American agencies engaged in planning or training, including the general staff, the intelligence and operations divisions, and the 7th US Army based in Europe. As early as December 1947, works by German generals appeared on War Department reading lists for army officers, while the works on the Soviet Union produced by the Germans were personally approved and, and expanded on by General Eisenhower, who was at this time the American military governor in Germany, by the Army Chief of Staff, Omar Bradley, and the Joint Chiefs in 1948. Demand for access to the studies increased over time, as American defense doctrine in Europe shifted to favor the German strategy of defense in depth. However, American planners ignored the fact that Wehrmacht, while grossly outnumbering the number of troops and equipment now available to NATO, had been never, nevertheless roundly defeated by the Soviets when using this defense in depth. So to conclude, there was no red juggernaut. In the late 1940s, Russian historians now generally agree that the nature of Stalin's foreign policy may be described as cautious expansionism in areas which he defined as basically the Soviet natural sphere of influence. Yet there was no master plan in the Kremlin, and Stalin's ambitions had always been severely limited by the terrible destruction uh, that the USSR suffered during the war and also the existence of the American nuclear monopoly. But part of the anxiety can be found in the nature of the Cold War, which had reached its zenith uh, during the late 1940s and early 1950s. The Soviet geopolitical and ideological threat per se was rarely a subject for deep debate, and the perception of, of an aggressive expansionist USSR permeated the Western political and military leadership. Particularly when addressing the Soviet Union, these historical studies written by the German generals contained very little actual history except in cases where historical experiences proved useful to illustrate the innate dangers, evils, and aggression of communism, or to reinforce the credibility of the German authors. Such studies provided to an interested American audience focused much more on hypothetical uh, future Soviet aggression and lessons learned from the Germans' failed attempt to defend Europe from the specter of communism than on actually reconstructing past experiences. Taken as a whole, the report series was riven with contradictions, a familiar brew of national socialist Darwinism, racism and anti-communism, fused with the traditional anti-Russian animus of the German officer corps. These essentially national socialist ideas appeared and reappeared in widely circulated US Army publications created for the purposes of accurately delivering the history of the Second World War and for educating and shaping future strategic doctrine in spite of rigorous efforts to purge politically unsuitable elements from positions of strategic influence. For many of the officers in question, even if they had never held membership of the Nazi party, national socialist ideas and conceptions of the Soviet Union disappeared slowly, if at all, after 1945. Substantial intellectual baggage underpinned the very German operational experiences against the Soviet Union that the US Army found so useful in the early phases of the Cold War. Through his personal efforts in obtaining the participation of many prominent German leaders and his extensive knowledge of military doctrine and strategy, Halder made a lasting contribution to the tactical and strategic thinking of the United States Army. In short, these German officers writing for the historical vision were of great importance for US Army planning organizations after 1945. Their strategic influence waned only as increased proliferation of battlefield nuclear weapons rendered the defense and death doctrine irrelevant with President Dwight Eisenhower's, Dwight D. Eisenhower's commitment to the so-called new look and massive retaliation as a deterrence against conventional Soviet attacks after 1954. Defense and death using conventional forces was therefore no longer viable. Yet it seems incredible that the United States and NATO would have relied up to 1954 on what basically amounted to Nazi ideology and propaganda, thus putting their armed forces and indeed the fate of Western Europe in great jeopardy. Thank you.